Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the importance of early childhood education with our special guest, Dr. Gabriela Garcia, Executive Director of the Storyteller Children's Center in Santa Barbara. Gabriela, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be talking about your organization and your take on early childhood development. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. Well, you know, if you take a look at the first five years of a children's life, it's so key to social learning, emotional learning, cognitive development. Children learn through various forms of, of interactions, and particularly children who have undergone trauma of various types, even in early childhood, where their parents might be under stress, uh, income is, is an issue. My own father had uh, dealt with these kinds of, of real traumatic experiences from his very, very earliest uh, childhood uh, mm -hmm. memories. And, and that has a really uh, incredible impact. How do you ameliorate that impact through your services that you provide to your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it, it is such a a formative time, right? In during the first five years, your brain grows ninety percent of of what it will throughout your life um, when you reach maturity, right? And that is a huge impact because trauma, stress, any type of adverse childhood experience manifests physically, and it can last your entire life, right? Especially if there isn't some form of early intervention. So it creates those patterns of, of response, right? Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And so we focus on the social and emotional development aspect of learning and, you know, of course, coupled with academics, but really what will carry you throughout your life and the tools that we're trying to provide for children who have experienced trauma, um, coupled with their families, of course, because families as the first true teacher will help to support this. And you only know what you know, right? So it, they also need to be educated to help their children. But we focus on the social and emotional development aspect of learning so that that can carry them throughout their life. So they have the tools to break cycles of generational poverty and trauma and are aware of how to de-escalate issues, how to, um, you know, self-regulate really. And, and that is the true key to a successful and healthy life. And, and what's going on here is as a child is growing, as you say, 90% of the brain develops in those first five years. As the child is growing and they are, they are feeling this environment, their brain is adapting to working within this environmental context, which means that if, if you take them outside of the trauma, they actually carry the trauma with them. So right. in many respects, what you're doing is you're, you're providing tools to, um, to counterbalance these tra uh, tra traumatic, trauma-informed instincts Mm -hmm. but you're also helping the family to navigate this, this terrain. So your services, while it's focused on the child, it's really broader than that, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, I like to say we're not just a, a preschool. We are a social change organization because it, in order to really make lasting change and sustainable change, we have to focus on the entire family unit to help them elevate out of whatever situation they may be in. And that is only done by partnering with them, right? In ensuring that they are uh, equipped with the tools to do that for themselves too. So we partner with the families, we provide a, a safe and, uh, you know, predictable environment for our children to learn, grow and thrive. A couple of ways. safe, right? Yeah, absolutely. safe, comforting. It, yeah, 100%. Um, two of our sites, we just inherited a new site, but two of our sites are homes because historically most of our children have been home insecure. So providing that sense of security is a huge part of being able to freely learn and grow, right? So providing the the resources for families, the education and services for children all of that coupled together really helps to strengthen the family and elevate them to break cycles on their own. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about cultural competency, because as we go across the United States and we work with organizations that serve primarily Native families or uh, Asian Pacific uh, families or Latinx uh, families, of, uh, of course, you know, Latin Hispanic basically describes a huge range of different cultures. Mm -hmm. Asian describes a huge range of cultures, Native American, huge range of cultures. But talk a little bit about how cultural competency, linguistic skills, and so on feed into the kinds of services that you provide and enable you to provide services that are relevant to that particular family with their particular cultural context. Yeah, absolutely. Well, 90% of our families are Latino or Hispanic. And so we really meet them where they're at, right? We don't expect them to be at a level where, they, where they're not because you only know what you know. And so we provide services in their language. So in Spanish, primarily, um, we are really culturally sensitive to experiences that they may have faced. 75% of our staff are of Hispanic or Latino origin as well. And so that really helps to gain trust. Um, Santa Barbara is a place where we have um a high concentration of Latino and Hispanic uh, people. So based on, you know, the, the agriculture here and um, immigration that has happened through throughout many years, that is the, the largest concentration that we have of culturally diverse uh, folks. So we really do tailor all of our programs to ensure the, the comfort, the equity, the um, linguistic um you know, inclusion for all of our families and, and our students too, so that they feel comfortable learning in a native language while also preparing them to enter the school system, um, you know, th through um, learning English. And, and I'd like to talk just a little bit and, and sort of make a, a plea just based on the practical realities that you're living to, to take the culture war stuff out of this, right? When you're mm -hmm. talking about children, this idea of understanding someone else's culture and then providing services within that culture is really about serving that child and serving that family. This whole idea about woke or non-woke or, you yeah. know, all this other stuff, it's kind of nonsense. I mean, if somebody is speaking primarily Spanish, right, in order to serve that, that family, you have to be able to speak their language. If they come from a, 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 an Asian or a Native uh, culture, you have to understand their cultural context. So right. understanding somebody who is not exactly like you, right, is really important to just providing practical human services, right? Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, we as an organization focus on that all the time. We talk about that, you know, early childhood education, high quality early childhood education should be a basic human right. And it you know, there, there isn't this, oh, well, they can pay or they can't pay or whoever, you know, can pay the most gets a spot because spots, as you know, we all know there, there's a child early childhood education crisis in, in our nation, really, there just aren't enough spots, especially in our state. Um, and of course, Santa Barbara, it, you know, this, the scarcity of having those, you know, really coveted spots are, are just, so few and far between. So it is a basic human right. And that is how we approach it. You know, we do not focus on just because you are of this culture or um, only speak this language, you know, that is how we will help you. No, it is all inclusive because there is no, there is no judgment, right. To what any person or any race or whatever it is might be facing. They're just the family it, circumstance. Uh, talk it, about right. the changes that you've seen, because when you were founded, the definition of family um, was uh, and the definition of, of what kind of services you provided, it was informed by a, a sensibility that has shifted over the years. Could you talk a little bit about that? And I know you had mentioned to us that you were doing um, in the midst of a rebranding and you might be renaming the organization. So talk about those changes, how sort of the, the, the flows of time and the perceptions of your clients and the perceptions of your board, your funders are shifting how you're thinking about yourself and how you're presenting yourself to your market. Right. Yeah, that's a great question because Storyteller was founded 35 years ago on the adage of a Native American storytelling um, 
cultural practice, right, of gathering a, a typically a woman teacher, gathering children to teach them about life and education through storytelling, which is a beautiful concept. And I think a concept that is, is still embraced today through the importance of telling stories in whatever sense, right? However, we have really shifted in it in our thinking in just the way society has changed and looked at families and family structure where it's not just females who are caring for families, right? We have single dads, we have, um, you know, grandparents or whoever it may be that have stepped up if needed to care for a child. And, and that is really where we have, where we're going, right? So in, in talking about cultural differences and just, really respecting everyone's culture and being equitable and, and and really just understanding how we have changed as an organization. I think I think the notion that Storyteller Children's Center is really helping to rewrite people's stories. I think that, you know, giving them the empowerment to to create their own story is beautiful. But I also think that we have grown in a way that is much more inclusive of a lot of different family structures. And so, so you're, you're talking about the fact that you could have um, uh, single parents, you know, where the head of the household is a father or a mother. Right. Um, you, you, you are talking about uh, same sex couples. You're mm -hmm. talking about situations where grandparents are caring for younger children. Um, or even cut, or even um, uncles and and aunts caring for for kids, and you're also talking about the fact that this sort of quite quaint notion that the storytellers were women mm -hmm. necessarily, and uh, even in Native American cultures, you know, it, it, storytelling was not just restricted to women, and there there were all sorts of practices that people outside of different tribes don't really comprehend, and so we create this sort of image that is not necessarily accurate. You're trying to shift that to, to bring it into a more contemporary sensibility. Is that correct? Right. Right. That, yeah, that's absolutely correct. So with focusing on this, you know, this notion of embracing lots of different families where we are looking at a rebrand and how, how do we represent um, everyone that we're serving equitably and accurately, right? So who is it that we are, that we are touching? What is it that we are really trying to accomplish as an organization focusing on the, the early childhood years, but to last a lifetime, right? So so that is really where our focus has been, and we're exploring the the, the rebrand um, of the organizations, which we hope to undertake within a year. Now, in 35 years, you've had enough of a track record to understand what kind of an impact you have had on people. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how you look at that impact and what kind of impact you'd like to have in the future? Is it different than the impact that you've had in the past? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I think looking back at the the trajectory of the organization, there have been so many stories and you know so many testaments to what we have done and being able to hear because I've been with the organization for a year now, but being able to hear all of the 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 great work that has been done and how one father who as a single parent was caring for his child said that storyteller was some of the safest eight hours in a day that his child and other children received. And I think that is huge. He also said that there were just no words to, to, to explain the, the tools that they were given to, to break themselves out of the situation that they were in. Um, from addiction to um, housing insecurity, right? And now they are on, are on a stable track. And I think that is the true testament. And that's what we want to continue doing. But we want to continue doing that in a, a much broader way. And by reaching even younger children with our recent acquisition of uh, another local program, starting from the age of six weeks, we 
really want to expand how we impact a family's life and to partner with them to grow in, in a healthy social, emotional, developmental way for their children. Well, it's very interesting what you're saying, because what you, uh, when you talk about the feedback from this father, right, a person who has undergone addiction, who mm -hmm. might have had interactions with the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. who might have been homeless um, and a child having been homeless. In a sense, you're, you're providing a safe space for that person as well, and you're with understanding you're helping them to evolve as as human beings of course it's mm -hmm. up to them but how do you deal with so many different people who have these different sensibilities these different lived experiences how does your staff um who themselves are unlikely to be uh to have gone through uh, addiction uh not necessarily or or uh interaction with criminal justice or uh, homelessness, how does that actually work? Or do you hire people who are living very close to those communities and really have had those experiences themselves, either directly or through other family members? Yeah, that is a, a really great segue into as an organization, we make sure that we take care of our staff mentally, especially because it is very taxing and we provide what we call um, a, an adult learning model that really focuses on this notion of making sure that they are understanding families who are undergoing this kind of trauma and, and children so that if they're triggered, that they're able to identify it and respond. A lot of our staff, who are teaching um, in, in, the, in the education area of our organization have undergone some kind of trauma. And so they do understand. And I think that's why the reflective practice is so important so that they, again, are able to identify a trigger that may be affecting them or identify how they can help with the with the guidance of a licensed therapist, right? So we we really focus on making sure that our staff is equipped emotionally and mentally to deal with the different types of struggles that families may be facing without judgment, of course. And I think that is one of the, the greatest things that we can offer is meeting families where they're at and giving them the tools that they need 100% without any judgment which is what makes them feel safe as well, right? We're providing their children with a safe space, but also the adults need to feel safe and trust us to do that. How many children do you serve annually? Annually, we serve about 100 and we are expanding. So we're really excited to, to grow. So that number will will grow exponentially. We're hoping about 150 per year. We are a a smaller mid-sized organization. So growing in, in the area is, is our goal. And we want to reach the, the most children that, and families that we can reach. So we're excited for that. Does growing mean more facilities, more staff? It seems like this is not a highly leveraged model. It's a very specific model in which there's a lot of high touch service. Is So it basically means having twice the facilities. If you're going to have twice the children, it's twice the facilities, twice, twice the staff. Right. So. Yes, especially because our programs are licensed through the state of California. So you have to meet certain ratios uh, for a teacher per child, right? So yes, that means more space, more staff. Um, and so slowly but surely, because we want to make sure that it's sustainable. How do you keep overhead down as you as you grow because you want to have most of your resource go directly to children, but you also mm -hmm. have, as you have more facilities, you have more things to fix, you have yeah. more buildings to manage, you have more people to manage. There's an overhead cost of doing this when you when you scale in this way. There, yeah, absolutely. And I think the most overhead that we have is the the staff salaries. We have really 
embraced living our mission and in the last year have exponentially raised staff salaries so that they are making a living wage. We don't want to perpetuate the cycle of poverty, right? And so a lot of preschool teachers historically make a very low wage. And so we are really proud that we are one of the highest paying um, preschools now in, in the in the county. So it, that has been a huge um, undertaking and a huge accomplishment for us. But we also have really generous funders. We're very you know, thankful to be in, in an area where we have people on our board who have been with us for 35 years since Storyteller's inception. So it's it's really a great thing to see community come together to help fix things. We have um, you know, local construction companies that will come and do repairs for us at no cost. Uh, we have, again, board members that generously give their funds to help keep our overhead and our spaces safe. So we're, we're very fortunate that way. What proportion of your revenue is contributed by uh, donors of various types? Individual donors um, is about 60% of a contribution. 60%. Yeah. So this is interesting. So this is the American capitalist system. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it's pension for voluntary income redistribution mm-hmm. to help those who live in a community who need it, right? I mean, this right. is this is part of the genius of the nonprofit system. It doesn't come from government. You can change uh, pretty quickly because if your donors don't feel like their money is being effectively used, they'll use it for something else. There's a mm-hmm. lot of accountability. How do your um, how do your uh, board members ensure that that you're able to deliver against against um, your intention and their intention when they fund you? Yeah, that's that's a great question because we have as an organization, especially as a board, made sure that we are communicating and changing the ways that we're you know being inclusive and talking about what we do and we have been really successful in that. We have the the data to prove, you know, that we are helping families. We, um, uh, you know, are, are really open about sharing what our expenses look like. And I think our funders really appreciate that. We keep in touch with them regularly. S- Santa Barbara and, and Santa Barbara County has a really tight knit group of nonprofit funders. And especially with the uh, such a high number of nonprofits here. I think we've been really fortunate that we have been able to to really live our mission and show that we are, you know, delivering what we say that we are are, are going to deliver. And so that has been one of the biggest contributors to recurring um, funding for us. So when your board members are are writing a check, they're investing in a child, right? They're investing in a family. They're investing in family. Yeah. And and they will write the next check because they believe that they are getting a positive return in terms of impact on that family and impact on the community. Right. And, you know, at Storyteller, we provide uh, two meals and a snack per day. So that is, you know, such a huge component, too, of being able to say, you know, we are really serving the entire child providing healthy, you know, nutrition for proper brain growth, giving them the tools that they need to carry through them throughout their lives. And, you know, the, the ROI, as we have seen in data to, you know, with the, the early intervention is about $7 return, which is huge. Um, in the later years. And what we are really doing is ensuring that we have community later on, right? Because these children are the future of our community. And with, especially in our area, being 118% more expensive than the national average uh, to live, it is that is a huge feat, right? Because we want these children to stay and return to this area. We want them to be the future of our, of our society. So, so I think that the, the return on the investment is invaluable. So for less than the cost of your daily cup of Starbucks coffee with perhaps a cookie for the morning, 
Right. You are actually investing in a child. Dr. Gabriela Garcia, Executive Director of Storyteller Children's Center in Santa Barbara. Thank you so much for sharing the great work of your organization. Thank you for describing how accountability works and how cultural competence works in terms of how you deliver services. It's really great to have your insights and it will help to inform us going forward in terms of our investment, perhaps less in Starbucks and more in children, right? Right. Thank you so much.